Welcome back, everybody. Hi. Hi, good morning. Hi, Karen. Hi, Tiffany. Hi, Hi good morning. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. Andrew, <laughs> Clarice. Hello. Hi. Is it Sheila? Am I saying that right? It's Sheila and good morning. Good morning. Hi, um, Sherry. How are you? Welcome, everybody, to our last book club meeting. I am I don't know about you, but I, I just told Caroline that it went way too fast. And I hope you all have enjoyed this time with us as well. Absolutely. Um, good. So we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to open us up in a prayer. And again, I'm Michelle Butler. I'm with the I'm on the board of the um, Center of Addiction okay. and Faith. And I'm honored to be here on the call with us is Pastor Ed, who is the founder and CEO and then Katie is our our girl wonder <laughs> behind and in front of the scenes that makes sure that everything goes smoothly for today. So we are so glad you all are here. So if we could just have a moment of silence and pause and reflect on those who are still suffering with the disease and those who love those who suffer with the disease. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Father God. We just come before you and just ask that you will continue to bless this space, this safe space of healing and recovery that you have given us over these past few weeks. Father, I pray that you will bless each and every participant, that you will bring them peace, grace, and love as they go forth throughout their day and every day. In your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 So we are so glad Amen. to have Caroline back with us. And she is an author, recovery advocate, founder of the storytelling platform Circle of Chairs, which is really cool. And her new book, which we are studying, The Downstairs Church, um, is available anywhere you buy books. And I know Caroline has mentioned if you have challenges with that, she can help you get a copy of the book. Um, and along with her her writing. She's also works with social work and ministry, and she is currently a consultant with JB, JBS International and a team writer for Grit and Grace Project. And we're just so honored to have her, and we thank you, Caroline, for being part of this organization. And I will pass it to you. Oh, thank you so much, Michelle. It is so nice to be back. Uh, with you all, I can't believe August just kind of flew by. Um, the team was talking about that before we uh, opened the doors today. And I really, truly uh, hope that you have um, received something from this time, um, something of value that you can take back with you uh, into your work and into your lives. Um, and I feel like, you know, that first session to now, I feel like it, it kind of feels like a marathon maybe. And you all are the ones who are like finishing the race with it. Um, I feel like there should be some type of, I don't know, award or medal, like you're made, you made it through the mud. Um, we've had some folks drop off, um, but you all are the committed group. And I just, I just want to give you a big virtual hug right now. Thank you so much um, for sticking around and um, caring about this issue uh, as much as I do and um, wanting to learn more and, and be vulnerable and share, you know, and I think there's a reason why. Um, and I certainly have been in places like that. And even today where I struggle with being vulnerable and sharing, especially in a group setting. Um, and so it's understandable that that might bring up some uncomfortable feelings and, you know, different things for some folks. Um, and with that, you know, I wanted to say just first off, um, you know, if you are reading the book through the month, um, there can be, and there is uh, some tough content in the book. So I really want to encourage you if in reading it, um, and then especially too, if you're planning on facilitating uh, a study group, a small group at your church um, or any community um, to, to check in, you know, with yourselves and folks who will be participating because there is some tough content. And I always like to encourage folks to reach out to the support that you have locally uh, in your community, you know, in your life, whether that's a counselor, a pastor, a friend, um, if you feel like some things are coming up for you. Um, I want you to know that you're not alone uh, in your experience and um, please reach out. Um, so with all that being said, um, I believe everyone has been here before. We might have a couple 
new folks. Um, I might have a, a couple friends joining today, um, but just so you all, uh, as I say this every week, I like to know what to expect. Um, usually it doesn't ever go the way I plan it to, um, but uh, or would plan, would like to plan it. Um, but let's expect the next hour to be um, really an informal, you know, it's a small group, intimate group, popcorn style, just raise your hand if there's something that you'd like to share um, or feel free to just come off mute. Um, and out of respect to the group, if we could limit our shares just to make sure that everyone who wants to share today can. Um, this meeting session is recorded, I believe, so just be aware of that as well. And if you have any concerns around it being recorded um, and things that you share, please follow up with um, either Michelle uh, or Katie or Pastor Ed after. Um, and I just want to send out a huge thanks again to the Center of Addiction and Faith, um, who has uh, presented this uh, month. Love it. Um, so it is, uh, this hour is sponsored by a faith-based group, but all pathways of recovery are welcome. Everyone is welcome here, and I'm so glad that you're here. Uh, so I wanted to kick off today um, with a couple questions, and then I really wanted to open up for discussion around, in general, what came up for you with the book, and how are you going to be um, bringing what you've learned or what's come up for you um, into your life, into your ministry, um, into your community. So with that said, uh, I know, and I, I'd like to begin some sessions this way, but I'm going to read a little excerpt. Uh, if you have the book, it's on page 159. Um, if you are a follower of mine on social media, first of all, I apologize. Uh, second of all, um, I did a little live video this morning, or not too long ago, actually, um, reading a little bit of this as well. So um, here we go. This is from chapter 19, and it's called Shine a Light is the chapter title, and it's on page 159. All righty. On Instagram, I recently saw a post by author and teacher Jenny Allen from the Passion 2022 conference. Now, I have never been to such a conference, but I have to admit that it was freakish to me how many college-age folks gathered together in a football stadium to talk about God and learn more about Jesus. Freakish in a good way, Margaret. Something like 60,000 of them. This was startling, but what was perhaps more startling was what I saw next. It was a picture of the smallish blonde woman named Jenny. Anyone know Jenny <laughs> Allen from like, yeah. the gathering? And, yeah. She was standing in her intentionally casual blazer and fun kicks near crates labeled weight and sin. She carried two of the crates as she spoke. What the enemy does is build a wall of shame and what you do is hide behind it. We do little dances in front of this, but our souls, our secrets, ourselves are actually tucked behind a wall because dare we tell anyone about the and then she led the students to confess out loud. That's right, confess, get it all out there. The dirty semen stained truth, the weight, what cannot be controlled, the sin, what can, the secrets from childhood, the lies, the conceit and pride. When I swiped right on her post, there were pictures of students bending arm in arm in small circles. Dreadlocks, hoodies, so many perfectly manicured eyebrows, 1990s fashion, oh my. Um, if, if you don't know, there's a lot of, I don't know, the, the next generation, they love the 90s fashion. I should have kept a lot of my clothes from back then. Anyways, I digress. Uh, and all of the outward signs of the younger generation, but inwardly, in my mind, I imagined the shaking, the fear, then the sweet release that only honesty and radical honesty can bring. Shining light coming out of the dark, just like I've witnessed in addiction recovery spaces. It was beautiful. It was real. And I wondered what would happen if this became common practice and not just during mega evangelical events, but every Sunday, every day. What if during small group, this public confession became a part what if in Lori's living room, so she, just from earlier in the book, she was a small group leader that I knew, uh, we smashed our teacups against the wall in anger at the injustice of what women experience. And what if we sang aloud our own secret transgressions and held each other as the guilt shattered like glass? Hello, I'm Caroline and I am a mess. 
Hi, Caroline. What would it look like if instead of receiving the message of grace, we became it? We became it. Yeah. You're muted. There we go. I muted myself. I, I would like to mute myself now. I would like to hear from you all. So what does it mean? What do you all think it means? A couple questions. To become grace. And what about this concept of confession that I talked about in this first session or section? Feel free to just jump right in. Yeah, Clarice? Um. I think that grace is very, 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 very critical today. I think there's a lot of lack of grace. And I think um, meanness, anger, put downs, et cetera, um, have become sort of okay and the norm, at least in some worlds and with some people. And I think that if we could have grace, if we could give grace to people in the form of grace we would like to receive for ourselves, I think our world could be a much, much better place. Um, I mean, I could go on and on, but I just think that um, there's just a lot of mean things that are being said and a lot of not okayness being done. Uh, I mean, all the mass shootings, all the, I mean, I could go on, but anyway, and I'm not sure if it's, I don't know that it's all related to alcohol or growing up in an alcoholic home, but I think that um, there's an okayness that is really wrong. And it's us as Christians, I'm assuming all of us are Christians, or at least people of religious belief. Um, we, we have to um, demonstrate that grace. Not that it's always going to be received or accepted, but yeah, that's sort of my little soapbox for two minutes. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. I, I connect with that. And um, just the idea that you bring up of there's so many situations right now in the world where it's like, you know, that extending that grace. Um, I don't know, for me, sometimes it feels like it, the only thing that I can do, you know, in the face of such injustice and things that we see every day, um, although it's challenging and, and I'm curious others thoughts. And also, um, you know, as I was reading, I was thinking that if I had another editor, like, look at this book, they might say I have too much going on. We're talking about confession. Then all of a sudden here is something about grace. I'm curious what, you know, how do those connect for folks too? Well, if I may speak again, um, I think that when we have the vulnerability to share what we're not happy about in our life, I mean, it could be everything from somebody thinking about what sin is in their life or just where we missed the mistake. What's that? Um, missed the mark. Then we hope if we do that, then we hope that somebody would give us grace in accepting that and receiving that and keep it confidential within the realm of that. And I know that that's what's supposed to happen in AA meetings. But I think that when we share, I mean, I think that confession can be, I've been studying a lot about post-traumatic stress. And I think that that's part of the problem is people don't talk about the stress, the trauma that they've had. And not necessarily that it's their fault, but if they can share that information with a trusted individual, then the trauma around that could hopefully dissipate a little bit. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing again. Anyone else have any thoughts? Yeah, it just brought me to um, James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And like First John 1, 9 was another one that came to mind. But just, um, I mean, it's in God's word that it's really important to share our lives with one another and confess what, you know, our, the bondage that we live in so we can get free from it. Mm -hmm. 
You know, yeah, and I think that's what that's what happens in the downstairs church. Uh, so naturally, that doesn't so much happen in the upstairs church. There isn't uh, there isn't much of the sharing of our brokenness. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I'm curious, kind of going off of that, does anyone have any ideas on, you know, bringing that quote unquote to the upstairs or what that looks like, or if you've experienced it? I know I talk in my book about a couple of different women's events um, that I went to that initially I felt, you know, so different and oh my gosh, it was going to be so different than recovery. And, um, you know, my hope through the book is to kind of bring those two pieces uh, of my life together um, and show how, you know, that vulnerability and honesty can happen um, in faith-based communities and all and in all communities. So I'm curious if anyone else has thoughts on that or have had uh, experiences. Um, Christine, mm -hmm. uh, my name is Roger and I'm a AA member uh, in Wisconsin. I'm also an Episcopal priest. And so this has had a very real uh, powerful impact on me. Um, I'm celebrating my 10 year anniversary this year and um, have, have witnessed in um, sermons and physical uh, uh, question questions with uh, parishioners ab about that uh, witness and grace and hope. Um, you know, it was, it was a wise, wise theme for me personally, but it was more wise in that it was a pastoral uh, condition, you know, that I could talk about it with them. I could let people know about um, the, the, the addiction. Um, so it, it's a powerful moment if the individual can, in some ways, set aside being ordained for being an addict. You know, you need to be careful and set them aside. Thank you for for sharing and uh, from Wisconsin. So uh, I'm from Wisconsin. I love that. Where in Wisconsin are you again? Um, Appleton. Appleton. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Um, I know some folks up there. Um, and even saying up there, that probably sounds yep. like I'm <laughs> up there. Um, yep. Anyone else? Tiffany, I see your hands raised. Hello, um, Tiffany, alcoholic. Um, I had to look up. Um, I hear it all the time, um, Grace, and I say it all the time. And I say, you know, let me look this up. <laughs> let me let me look at the definition. Um, and you know, it 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 immediately said undeserved favor. And yeah, that's that's exactly what I've been given because mm -hmm. when I do confess when I have confessed and I and I hear it I'm like whoo I don't I understand why they're not talking to me either I understand why I don't have a key to their house I understand why I, we love you but you know um but my faith and the God of my understanding when I finally got it, like there's nothing I have to do to receive that favor. And it, it kind of brings tears to my eyes because like, I don't have to do nothing, nothing. It's unconditional, unconditional. Um, on another note with the upstairs church, and I, I'm gonna be honest, <laughs> Carolyn, I haven't had the time to like really, I, like I'll go through pieces of the book because I'm like, wow, this is good. Then I, something will happen. But I, um, I'm about to sit down and really dig in, <laughs> really dig in um, because it's, I like this type of platform because I like 
to talk, you know, and hear others' opinions. But as far as the up tier upstairs church, it's come, they're they're getting in tune. And I and I'm realizing there one, I'm hearing more about mental health in the church, upstairs church. Um, and this the the disease of alcoholism, substance use disorder, addiction period, you know, recovery period are hitting so many families that really you don't have a choice but anymore to really talk about. And no one's afraid anymore. It's not that hush hush word anymore. Um, because I can guarantee from my experience, everyone, somebody I walk by, or sit next to is has some type of experience, whether personal or in their family, with some type of substance use disorder. We just weren't taught to talk about it. And now it's finally being talked about. Um, and that's what I love about um, what platform I'm in when I'm sharing and some of you all can probably definitely identify when I go into some places hi I'm a woman in long-term recovery their ears yeah. are open yeah hi my name is yeah. Tiffany I'm an alcoholic and an addict hi Tiffany you know like well you know it's a difference but however I have to bring it I'm I'm finally able to bring it but I just wanted to share that sorry if I took too long thank you Never too long, I, Tiffany. I uh, I appreciate you being here again. I was so excited to see you, and um, I would love to check in. I know last time, you know, you shared a little bit about what's been going on, um, and and the loss you experienced. So you've definitely been on my mind. Um, so I'm so grateful to see you, and I I love that you. Um, I'm a word person too, so looking up, you know, what does grace actually mean, and um, getting a little bit cheery about that because it is it is so moving like I remember when I you know became a Christian and um started truly understanding what it meant to feel loved unconditionally and um you know I think because of the trauma I experienced sometimes I still struggle with that like what really accepting that love um and truly accepting that love um I think for me through the recovery process that helps me remember um sometimes and um Anyways, I love that. And um, thank you so much for bringing that up and just your experience. I'm curious if others have, you know, similar experiences around just yeah. receiving grace. I know Pastor Ed. Um, yeah. Well, I I, I was going to share a little bit about how uh, mm -hmm. what you referred to as experiences with the upstairs church and sharing. Um, uh, I had a very eye-opening experience in my first call process. I just graduated seminary in 1995. And I got an interview with a church in rural Nebraska, and I had put in my paperwork that I was a, a recovering person, that I was a member of AA. And uh, and I went to this interview, and before we went in to meet with this group of people to discuss whether I would be their next pastor or not, the uh, chair of the committee pulled me aside and he pointed to the AA thing in my paperwork and he whispered, what do we do about this? It's like it was some big shameful thing. And I said, well, just have yeah. me talk about myself. So um, I uh, went into the interview and the chair's person said, Pastor, tell us about yourself. So I told him my AA story and um, gave him all the details, probably more than I needed to. But anyway, we got done and the council president said, oh, I didn't introduce everyone else. We should go around and say who we are. And so one at a time, people began to say their name, but then they would divulge something they've been struggling with. And it turned into a little 12 step meeting. And uh, we got done and somebody said, what just happened here? This was amazing. Um, and what I realized was, is that people are hungry to talk about their brokenness. They just need a place and a space to do that. And when, when we set the tone by being vulnerable ourselves, other people are like ready to jump in. And I thought that's the gift recovering people have, the downstairs church people have to give to the upstairs church is that authenticity, that vulnerability because people are hungering for it. And if you can find ways to uh, to make that happen in safe places where people can share their hurt, um, it's a gift, it's a huge gift. 
Did you get that position? I'm curious. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They actually mm -hmm. offered me more money for it. <laughs> they didn't want to lose me. <laughs> did you take it? Yes, I did. It was a great <laughs> call. I was out with the corn and the cattle. <laughs> <laughs> Yeehaw. Yeah. I think a lot of things is tied into Shane. I'm sorry, my name is Shari, and um, I work in the field of substance abuse with various members, either in, in the jails or prisons, as well as I've worked with veterans. So I, I work with, with the population, and I'm also an adult child of an alcoholic, um, although my dad would probably never admit that he did have a drinking problem. As I got more versed in the field, I saw a lot of the different signs that was there, not only him, but many of my, my aunt's relatives. Um, so I think it, it ties into shame and guilt because yeah. the stigma that is associated with raising your hand or confessing that I am a, a alcoholic or addict using those terms carry so much of a weight and people are not so quick to jump out there and say that they're struggling with the disease of addiction until somebody else opens the door and say that I am. And even then I, I, I see that people may kind of tread lightly, especially in the, in the church world. Um, now you go to a meeting, that's a different thing, but inside the church world, I do believe, you know, that stigma is there. And the more we talk about it, the more we can break the stigma and the shame that's associated with it so people can get the help that they need. Agreed, agreed. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sarah, you have your hand raised. And then Michelle? Yeah, and I apologize. I missed a little bit. My internet's been out. Can you guys hear me okay? It's been in and out. Um, just a couple things that I wanted to share. So first of all, I'm in recovery from alcohol and from Marinette, Wisconsin. I was just home. I'm in Minneapolis now. I went to school in Madison. So recovery brought me back to spirituality, which I'm sure is pretty similar for a lot of people. So I'm trying through my church to bring recovery and openness and really like just battle that shame and stigma. I work with people that are coming out of incarceration. So a lot of mental health and recovery. Um, I just keep still my wheels at my church. And so what I thought was really interesting that I wanted to share is I've, I've offered the book like for our, you know, just to share that um, in our library. And that's kind of just on, on pause as well. And I've tried to just start some different groups. And now I finally actually connected with two Oh no, I think we I think lost Sarah. Lost Sarah. Yeah, Sarah, we lost. Um, I'm going to type in the chat maybe if she wants to join back to just use audio. But in the meantime, um, Michelle, do you want to? Yeah, I think you had your hand raised too. Um, I was clapping, but I'll share. <laughs> um, Michelle, alcoholic. Um, I, I, I qualify for a few other programs. Um, and just to add to the conversation, the underlying you know, theme of trauma. You know, when we talk about, especially women in addiction, women who are incarcerated, many of them, you know, are off the charts on the ACEs scale. And so for my experience in working within minority churches, it's it's easier to go in through the trauma, um, the trauma, you know, subject. Um, a lot of times people don't even realize they have trauma. Um, but if you look at a lot of marginalized communities, there's generational trauma um, which therefore leads to like generational substance abuse and addiction. And, and for me, that's helped take some of the shame out of the context when I present, um, you know, the, the background of trauma and people, you know, their eyes are kind of like, okay, so now I don't have to be so, you know, guilty or feel so guilty or bad about this. It's like, yeah, of course I'm going to medicate. So um, yeah. I just want to add that to the conversation. Thanks.
Thanks so much, Michelle. And it looks like Sarah may have jumped off again, um, which is unfortunate. I think she was giving us an update on where things are at. Oh, there she is. Hey, Sarah, are you there? I don't see her. Okay. Um, well, Sarah, feel free to jump in if you can. You can also uh, type in the chat. Really curious to hear yeah. how things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if, if you can hear me, the only thing, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. yes. Just real quick. So all I wanted to do was like spinning my wheels at church, connected with two other women in recovery through very, I, I mean, I'm sure God has a plan, right? And we are going to read and study the book outside of church and send by other women that may want to be even more authentic um, and just aren't finding that at the church right now. And we're just going to connect. Oh no, so, gotta love Zoom. Just the yeah. oh, Sarah's back again. What's wrong with Wisconsin? We need to get their acts together and zoom in the internet. Yeah, but she said she's in Minneapolis now, so that doesn't count. Oh, okay. Oh, it's Minneapolis, <laughs> so that's why. We, <laughs> no. we use we use Wisconsin internet. <laughs> Well, Sarah, maybe if you have um, a keyboard access, if you want to type in, I'm sorry, you have some connection issues. And I would love, I put my um, email in the chat. I would love, love, love to connect with you um, and talk a little bit more about the um, small group guide that I created that's free. It's on my website. And if you're going to be taking, you know, a group of women through um, through the book, um, I'd love to just hear more about your plans and um, get to know you a little bit. Um I wanted to share just related to the stigma piece. So it it really, it just brought to mind this um, memory I have that I, I there's a woman actually back in Wisconsin um, who used to present in emergency departments on stigma. And she shared with me a little brief part of the presentation and I thought it was so interesting. So she would talk and she had her own experience of uh, overdose and then winding up in the hospital repeatedly. Um, in the emergency department. And so she started off the presentation with a slide picture of uh, herself as a little girl and would then ask the physicians, nurses, doctors, would they have the same attitude about, would they treat this little girl the same um, as they treat a lot of the folks coming through who are experiencing addiction issues and substance use related issues? Um, trying to help them think about, you know, that person is more than just what they are struggling with. Um, and that as, you know, Michelle, you mentioned, there is a, a root, uh, there are um, sometimes intergenerational things going on, you know, where addiction is something that cycled through families and trauma is such a huge piece of that. And so to bring that context and make it larger, that it's not just about someone using drugs and alcohol and, um, it's, it's about so much more. So I just wanted to share that. That just came to mind quickly. Um, we're at, we have about a half an hour left um, or less here because I want to make sure the Center of Addiction and Faith has some time to talk about some things they have going on. So I want to open it up for folks who have read the book um, or who, folks who've just attended this month. What are some things that have come up for you as you've been reading? And are there any specific, you know, um, scenes or um, stories from the book that you'd like to talk about and, and share a little bit more about today. I hardly think that um, it's the it's an incredible need for awareness of the impact that alcohol can have, not just on the individual, but also on the family. And being an adult, an adult child, when I first discovered it, Ed probably will remember me saying this. It was like an emotional earthquake for me to realize the care a pastor gave me the characteristics of an adult child. And I it was just like an emotional earthquake. And I think that there is so much in terms of generational trauma. And one of the things that really concerns me is the impact of a soldier, a veteran, a combat veteran and how alcohol is used to anesthetize the trauma that they've had, and then how that gets transferred through the inner generations for the children who, um, who may think it's their fault that their parent 
is an alcoholic, but the real reason was combat and being a veteran and what have you. And I think that, I mean, that's a whole nother kind of a thing. And there should be the downstairs um, VA <laughs> clinic <laughs> uh, in order to help people that are recognizing that alcohol has been used to anesthetize not just combat veterans, but anybody who has been through some kind of a trauma. Um, so I, I don't know, I just, I could go on and on, but I just have very strong feelings about that. Yeah, and like Michelle mentioned, I mean, that's such a huge, important topic. And I know you and I have talked a little bit offline about, you know, your experience and, um, and, and I think with, with veterans too, you know, I mean, we may not have had the same experience of be, you know, being in the service or experiencing combat, but so many of us have experienced things that cause similar symptoms of post-traumatic stress um, that, you know, how, how do we as, you know, whether you're a behavioral health provider, a pastor, um, a priest, um, a lay person, like whoever we are, how do we support folks along a journey? Um, you know, I know with our small church in Eastern Tennessee, um, there's folks who are looking at trying to provide support for veterans, um, but really encountering some roadblocks in that people are, are not comfortable to step forward to sit in that circle. Um, you know, so what does it take to bring folks into that circle to make that circle safe? And um, I don't want to say appealing, but you know what I mean? Just having that be a place where people want to come. It's hard. It's really challenging. Um, and there also obviously has to be that willingness from the person too. Um, yeah. Thanks for sharing. Anyone else have thoughts on um, anything specific from the book that they want to share? If you haven't read the book, maybe something that's just coming up from our conversation today. Hey, My first time here, um, and I appreciate the opportunity to listen in. Um, the thing that is attracted me to this webinar was the title of the book. Um, because I, I'm not a recovering addict of any kind, but I have had relationships with people, friends that are and, and were. And um, I was invited to attend meetings with a friend and it happened to be in a church basement in an Episcopal church basement. And, and I was intrigued at that time, this was years ago with the fact that these meetings were taking place in the basement, sort of a isolated, removed place from the life of the church. And uh, just as a side, I'm a pastor in the Lutheran church. Mm. However, um, there are a lot of churches that don't have basements that host um, AA meetings and um, addiction meetings. And But the, the concept of it is that this is a separate engagement that's really, really separate from the ministry of the church. And that bothered me as a, as a young pastor then, um, and I say young in my first years, not young in my age, but um, as I moved in ministry and have served in churches um, and the one that I'm in now that doesn't have a basement, but trying desperately before I retire, to bring awareness um, of this reality to the forefront, even to the suggestion that this congregation be open to an, an AA organization. Um, and it's taking work, not that people haven't experienced it in their lives, in their families, but because of how the church has lived with such judgment of people mm -hmm. and, and such focus on sin as a means of separating people, putting mm -hmm. boundaries around the space of God's house <laughs> and saying, folk, 
that have these issues, this and so many other things can't come in or can't be a part of the life of the church, that barrier is one um, that still needs breaking. And whether whether we're doing it in a in through the basement of a church or on a ground level of church, but your title, your book title just it it brought it to light. Um, yeah. It brought it to the surface. And and I'm appreciating, you know, the discussion that goes after that. But to say we've put this issue and the people that live it in a place below ground yeah. in the church. Yeah. And, and how is that being the grace of God? So, so that's my appreciation of, of your, um, your book and all that is in it from that perspective and the work that we have as the church to do. Is it preached? Okay. I'll, I'll echo that. Amen. 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 Amen for sure. Yes. I'm convicted. I picked it back up, Carolyn. <laughs> I'm reading it to never start <laughs> again. No guilt. No guilt. <laughs> Thank you. We give and you I grace. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I, I have to say, I have to say, Doris, we, you're you're talking uh, what feels very familiar to me for the lot. I have tried for so long to try to get the upstairs church to respond yeah. to what the downstairs church has to offer, and there's just been nothing but resistance. And I think there, yeah. I think there's a lot of terror there. I think people are afraid because yeah. I think they see in them something of themselves, and they don't want to look at that. Yes. And, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, and so it's been it's been really challenging to make that happen. I thought for me, my calling in life was to get recovering people into the church because I thought they would be blessed by that. And it occurred to me uh, at one point, no, I got to get church people into recovery. Uh, recovering people are doing great. They're very grounded. They're spiritual. They're healthy. Uh, church people are hearing the gospel, but they're not doing it. You know, they're not practicing anything uh, to deal with their issues, and so they really need recovery. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, Roger, patience again. I, I, when I went to my recovery meetings, I went to them in the basement of another church in a town next to mine. Um, I couldn't go to the one in the basement of my church mm -hmm. because I didn't feel comfortable um, with that. So close close exposure uh, so I went I went you know 10 miles uh, another direction um, but I, I like you Ed have found um, my belonging is to to welcome to the church people who are in recovery um, you know they're they're doing well in recovery um, but they often um, have uh, have have they have had uh, forget that. Um, so yes, getting recovery people to church would would be yes. I sometimes think that a lot of churches keep maybe a, quote unquote allow <clears throat> AA groups to meet, but it's sort of quiet. It makes me think that I need to check out. I know that at one point my church had AA meetings. I don't know if they still do, but nobody announces it. Uh, but so I'm realizing that I need to to check that out. Now, we're a church that does not have a basement, but we do have a parish hall. So I think that that's where the those folks meet. But I think the biggest problem I know is, is just being able to share the raw gut experience that people have that causes them to use drugs and alcohol 
as anesthesia, and I've used I've said that before, but I know that for myself, I, growing up in an alcoholic home, it caused me to feel for so very long that it was quote unquote my fault or somehow the behavior was because of me, when in actuality, I just happened to be close to those people who were drinking and therefore I got the, I don't know what the right word is, but I got the, uh, I was within the hitting distance. <laughs> I don't know what the word is. There's a word, but, and I th just think it's really sad that so many people, me included, have a hard time admitting to what has happened to us because we see it from a shame base. Yeah. I think it's John Bradshaw who said um, something about, I am shame because we think of ourselves as shameful when it's really not us that's shameful we perceive shame if that makes sense yes yes good stuff here everyone karen you've got your hand raised hi yes i um, i just like to chime in real quick here and hopefully i don't find myself in the weeds um about the um just quickly on two things the the church the church and the downstairs church, um, we don't even have a downstairs church, a downstairs church. We are, the church that I, my neighborhood church that I go to doesn't even really address recovery. I mean, there's, unfortunately, and and I, I, there's so much unspoken judgment, I think, in church or at least uh, and then on the flip side of that sorry i'm kind of rambling but on the flip side of unspoken judgment then it's like but is it more just a perceived judgment on my part like i because oh, i'm a recovering alcoholic maybe i think that there's judgment i don't know so i have to i have to step back and kind of think about that but but we still, the, the truth remains that the church does not address reco recovery at the at my little neighborhood church that I go to. Now, when time permits, I do go um, to a church that's a little further away. I think you mentioned it, Caroline, in your book, Saddleback, with um, Pastor Rick Warren. Um, they have a big program um, on recovery and, and um, it, it it's you know you very welcoming and 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 a great place to just open up and go but unfortunately i'm not always um time doesn't always permit um but at any rate before i do completely derail the train um if i could just um uh double back to the topic of grace um and thank you for the lovely lady that reminded us of um of uh, gave us the um the meaning of what what grace is um you know we're so willing to accept it but yet or at least for me at times um so unwilling to give it and um i think that that is something that you know uh, we need to really work on uh, personally, singularly, and then as a whole in, in, in the church as well. And, and I think that it, um, just quickly on your chapter 23, when the heart of the matter and you quote, um, there's a quote in there from Philip Yancey, who wrote the wonderful book, um, What's So Amazing About Grace, um, which is on my shelf and I need to pick it up on the daily. Um, it's he says the future for Christians depends on how we master the art of giving grace. And, and, and that really, for me, um, says it in a nutshell, it's the art of giving grace. And if we could all do that um, and um, stop um, standing in such judgment of one another, because for those that 
um, have never struggled with addiction, um, you know, there's, there's just so much shame that goes along with it and to be, feel like you're being judged for, um, you know, for, you know, um, moral, a moral um, failing or what have you is very, very hurtful. And I think we just need, like Philip Bianchi says, to master the art of giving grace. So thank you for letting me share and taking your time. Thank you. Aaron, thank you so much for sharing that. And um, I'm, I'm so glad that you have a place. It sounds like when you can make it to Saddleback, um, but if not, I'm hoping that you have a supportive recovery community in your area. Um, and I love, you know, Philip Yancey, as you probably noticed from how many times I quote him in my book, um, I love his books. He's actually coming out with an updated revised edition of What's So Amazing About Grace this fall. Um, so I'm excited about that. I'm sure more information will be coming soon. Um, but thank you for being here. And Michelle, it looks like you've had your hand up. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for calling on me. Um, hi, Pastor Ed. Thank you, Caroline, for your book. I didn't get a chance to read it, but um, I'm a recovering addict. I do um, attend Narcotics Anonymous, and I've enjoyed the discussion thus far. Um, I consider myself a community pastor, although I have a seminary degree. Um, my uh, my identification as an addict and the church's response to me <laughs> has clearly sent a message that I belong in the field. Um, I do work right now as a crisis specialist. And when I think about um, giving grace and sharing my story, it, it does just go over so much easier out in the field. But um, I do believe that I am called to bridge the gap between how the church provides services to families that struggle with addiction and mental health. And so um, the reason I wanted to speak was because I really do, as a member of a 12-step of a program, I know that the traditions um, do not encourage churches to advertise that there's a meeting going on and different things like that. Narcotics Anonymous and unlikely the parent organization, Alcoholics Anonymous, um, don't want to rely on outside resources to carry the message of hope and to carry the message of recovery. And because I work with a nonprofit and write grants, um, I know that that's another thing that Narcotics Anonymous doesn't want to be a part of. They don't want to be mentioned in grants. They don't want to be um the numbers of attendance to be reported to funders because they want to be an organization that's anonymous. Um, and I, I understand it and I respect it because I'm a member and because I, under, and I, I benefited from the traditions. Um, however, as a, as a uh, pastor's kid twice, as a, um, a person who's been shamed and shunned by the church while at the same time raised in the church um, and also called by God to um, preach the message of salvation of Jesus Christ. I understand that there's a need, there's many needs. And, um, and I wanna be a part of the solution and how um, or if I'm supposed to weave my 12 step experience into that process, um, it has to just be done very carefully, I believe. I believe it has to be very carefully because I wanna honor both um, Jesus Christ but at the same time, it's critically important to me to honor the traditions. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. It looks like we um, are about at time. So I know folks probably have more to say, but um, just a reminder, you know, let's keep the conversation going and um, think more about how we all can um, bring this concept of bringing the upstairs and downstairs church together and what we can learn from the downstairs church into our communities, into our churches, into our homes and our lives. 
uh, in neighborhoods. And I want to also, before I hand things over, remind folks that uh, I do have a free book club kit and small group guide, and I hope that you'll access that and use that. And if you're interested in talking to me more about having a small group um, using the book to facilitate conversations about this in the future, please let me know. And um, with that, thank you so much again to the Center of Addiction and Faith folks, um, and I'll hand things over. Again, thank you all much, so much for joining us this month. And a big thank you to you, Caroline, uh, for your willingness to share your book and yourself these last four weeks. I know that you don't just show up here. You you have to plan and think about uh, what you're going to present and talk about. I, I know you put some really good work into that video, that the excellent video you did, and to lead these conversations. So um, thank you for all of that. That's such a huge gift to all of us. So uh, I really appreciate your book because it really preaches the whole mission of the Center of Addiction of Faith, this whole conversation between the upstairs and the downstairs church it's it's a mystery um it's a puzzle but i think there's a, a calling there to try to to make some inroads in each direction so i'm grateful for this conversation i love these kind th this is what i was just at a meeting yesterday with someone and they said you know what is it you love what, about what you do and i said these conversations these conversations mean everything to me i just love this that we're talking about this because i think it's um, I, I've incredibly spiritual. I feel the presence of God in these places. And so thank you for, for uh, creating space for, for us to feel God's presence and, uh, and inspire us with, with mission and purpose. So we have a, a great follow-up webinar next Wednesday. It really fits well with what we've been talking about all week is how to create a, 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 an addiction awareness ministry in your church. And uh, I'm going to share a little bit of, uh, but we have Drew Brooks coming and he will, uh, he's been training congregations for over 20 years on how to do this. Um, he teaches congregations how to, how to assemble a team, how to, how and what to do, develop a mission statement and the kinds of things you can do in a congregation to raise awareness around addiction and to reduce stigma. And then we have a pastor who's doing it. Um, um, pastor John Sutherland is in Wisconsin which is, seems strange to me, but anyway, there he is. He's in Wisconsin and he is knocking it out of the park. He's doing, his church is just doing some amazing stuff. And in a time, post COVID time, when most churches are shrinking, his is growing. And it's mainly due, according to him, mainly due to, to the work that uh, he has uh, partnered with us uh, to do and, and to help raise awareness around addiction. And it's, uh, he's, he's impacting the whole town of Roberts, Wisconsin. So. He's got a great story to share. So that'll be next Wednesday. And I will put in the link or in the chat page here, a, uh, yeah, I can't talk and do chew gum at the same time. So I'm gonna do this. I'll put the link for registration there so you can attend the webinar next Wednesday. And then in October, October five through seven, oh, and next, next month's webinar, uh, end of September, we have Father Ed, Dowling is uh, um, an author who's written a book about Father Dowling, uh, who was the advisor to Bill W. is uh, is going to be on the webinar, and that'll be that'll be very interesting information for Recovery Awareness Month. And then in October, Center of Addiction and Faith is hosting its annual conference, and this is our showpiece for the year. This is the big thing that we do, and people come and are incredibly inspired. I was thinking what it is about these conferences that are so great, and it's because of the language that we speak. We speak in this group where we're just honest and authentic. Um, it happens in 12-step meetings, but it happens at this conference, and I think that's why these conferences are so powerful, because we have people talking about the church, they're talking about recovery, and they're doing it in a, such a genuine, authentic way. That's October 5th through 7th. Um, register for that. Come to it. You won't be sorry. Um, prior to the conference, we have a pre-conference retreat just for clergy. So if you're clergy and you're in recovery, we have um, two days where we'll be gathering prior to the conference, and that's a free will offering. Um, so it's no expense unless you know you have some resources that you can share. That's great. But um, that's just clergy, and we're talking about what it's like to be clergy in recovery, and that's... Um, it's challenging to be clergy. It's challenging even more so to be clergy in recovery because yeah. you deal with uh, all kinds of triggering 
all kinds of ways you get triggered as a recovering person in a parish. Um, and so it's really wonderful to be with other clergy who are able to talk about what that's like and, and uh, how to be, uh, how to stay, stay alive <laughs> and stay well in the midst of a uh, very challenging calling. Um, so those are the things I wanted to tell you about. But um, again, my great thanks to Caroline for her book and for her sharing, for Michelle, for your leadership these last four weeks, for being here and uh, being such a great host. And for Katie, who's behind the scenes, thank you for Katie for keeping all the gears running smoothly. I uh, appreciate you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Caroline, can we close with the serenity prayer if any if any if nobody has anything else. Better hurry because you're losing everybody. Okay. Let's say a quick concerning prayer using the we version. God, God, God grant us the serenity, serenity to do the, the things, things we cannot change. Cannot change the courage to change courage the, things to change the things we can and the wisdom to know the difference. Thank you. Amen. Thank, Amen. You everybody. Thank, so you everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank you.